Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We recently started teaching the book at Tadmuriya, written by Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, and it's a book that deals with the names and attributes of Allah. It's actually a book that is said to be a summary of all of his works, and it's something that we didn't find easily accessible in the English language. We therefore took the opportunity to start teaching this to our students live on Zoom. What you're about to watch is a recording of the first lesson of this brand new book. If it's something that interests you and you'd like to continue the class, then you can head over to patreon.com forward slash AMAU. وَأَقُولُوا فِي الْقُرْآنِ مَا جَاءَتْ بِهِ آيَاتُهُ فَهُوَ الْكَرِيمُ الْمُنْزَالُ وَأَقُولُوا قَالَ اللَّهُ جَلَّ جَلَالُهُ وَالْمُصْطَفَ الْهَادِي وَلَا أَتَأَوَّالُ الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى today we're going to be starting the explanation of a big and powerful and great book the kitab is Matnu at tadmuriya So inshallah ta'ala today I'm going to focus on two things Al-Mu'allaf and Al-Mu'allif So I'm going to I'm going to inshallah ta'ala speak about two things The first thing I'm going to speak about is the author uh, of the book and then I'm also going to talk about the book itself inshallah ta'ala and we're going to have a good understanding of this book and what it's about and why this book and etc and then inshallah ta'ala uh, I'm also going to speak about the author of the book who is he Shaykh al uh, uh, a bit about him inshallah ta'ala so is everybody with me? So what I'm going to do, inshallah ta'ala, is we're going to go to the whiteboard. Um, we're going to go to the whiteboard, inshallah ta'ala. Can everybody see the whiteboard? Okay, alhamdulillah. So let's first talk about who the author of this book is, okay? Who is the author of this book, okay? A bit about who he is, and then inshallah ta'ala, because we'll, we'll appreciate the book more if we know who the, who the author of this kitab uh, is. So, I want to speak about the author of this book from two perspectives. Okay, I want to speak for, about him from two perspectives, inshallah ta'ala. The first one is, an hayatuhu al-shakhsiyya. Hayatu al shakhsiyya, his personal life. Okay, it's important we, we know him as a person. And then I want to speak about him from another perspective, which is Hayatuhu uh, al ilmiya His uh, educational uh, achievements. Rahimahullahu, uh, rahmatan wasi'ah. Okay, so those are the two perspectives I'm going to speak about the author. Is everybody here with me, inshallah ta'ala? Is everyone with me? So this class, inshallah ta'ala, one of the beautiful things I'm going to try my best to incorporate in this explanation is there's going to be uh, an interaction between us, uh, me and you guys, inshallah ta'ala. So I'm going to ask you questions. You're going to answer the questions. Um, I need to know you guys understood what I said. I'm not going to move forward until the students say, we, we've understood this point. Next point now. Until that's said, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to move forward. Also, another thing, inshallah ta'ala, is my explanation here is going to be very, 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 very detailed. So every point, I'm going to stand over it. I'm going to go into explanation. I am going to, inshallah ta'ala, speak about this book. Yani details, amik. Uh, I'm relying about, on 13 different explanations. Each explanation, I'm taking benefits from it, and I'm going to incorporate it to the, in, into the explanation. About 13, inshallah ta'ala. And... Um, but I will explain it and I will make sure everyone, inshallah ta'ala, understands it. But I'll work hard towards doing that. Um, if I'm using a lot of Arabic terms and you don't understand, you can ask me and I'll explain it for you, inshallah ta'ala. Okay? 
uh, don't be shy. They say two people don't ever learn. The arrogant and the shy person never learn. So if you want to learn, get rid of arrogance and also get rid of shyness. Ask. Don't think, oh, I, 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 if I ask, I'm going to seem like I'm dumb. It's not. Just ask. And, and ask me to repeat it again if you still haven't understood it. Just don't follow the crowd. If they say yes, 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 yes. So that means I should also say yes. It doesn't mean that. Okay. Uh, they are going to happen sometimes, some information that you're going to think this, uh, I'm not even understanding it the third time or the fourth time. Don't worry, just keep asking. Inshallah ta'ala might come from this angle of explaining it, sometimes from this perspective, sometimes from this angle, sometimes from this. I'll try different ways of trying to explain it, inshallah ta'ala. And if I feel like I'm still not getting the message across to you, we will try, inshallah ta'ala, maybe to get one of the students to, to take the microphone, him to explain it, and I'll listen. And inshallah ta'ala, it's something we're all going to do together, bin Karim, okay? I just don't want it to come out as a class where I am the only one talking and there's you guys are just this, just there. Because that's not what's going to happen, inshallah ta'ala. Another point I want to say is that this book, there's a reason why I chose it. The first reason I, I chose it is because I haven't come across anyone explain this book in the English language in details. I haven't. Okay? Maybe there are people who've explained it, but not in detail. So I thought maybe this could be the first time the English-speaking world can actually get this book explained in detail and they can benefit from it, inshallah ta'ala. That's the first reason. The second reason why I like this kitab and I want to explain it is because it's a summary of the works of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. It's the conclusion of ibn Taymiyyah's works. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, the conclusion of his works is Kashf al-Shubuhat. Kashf al-Shubuhat is the Zubda, it's the conclusion of it. And ibn Taymiyyah, the kitab at Tadburiya is the conclusion of Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah's works in Aqidah, in Aqidah, okay? That's the conclusion. Ibn Taymiyyah has written many works. This kitab is the khulas, the zubda of, of, of the, all of those. So if you really understand this book, you can really step into all of his other works, okay? Everyone you tend to find who critiques Ibn Taymiyyah, who speaks against Ibn Taymiyyah and says, Ibn Taymiyyah said this, he's a heretic. Individual, they never get it out of his what? They never get it out of his uh, his kutubs, his books. Somebody said, "What does zubda mean?" Zubda means conclusion. Zubda means the gist, the conclusion. Mashallah, it's good that you're asking. That's what I want. I want everybody to say this to me. Inshallah, um, What was I saying? Yeah, those people who speak about Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, who critique Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, who say he's a heretic and, you know, he said this and this is heresy and wahakada, they get those statements from عند المناظرة. At a time, ibn Taymiyyah is debating with his opponents. He's trying to, yani in his, they take, they get it from his mutawwalat, his detailed books, his, yani big books that he speak, they get it from there and they say, look what he said here. And look what he said here. And look what he said here. And this really isn't what Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah is be he believes in some situations. It is just him trying to, trying to show how yani, dim-witted this argument is that this is going to be a belief you're going to have to have if you say this. And then they, they bring that from it and bring it to the table and say Ibn Taymiyyah believes this, which he doesn't. So when you really want to hold someone account for, for something, they, you generally have to get it from their books of ta'seel. In the books of Shaykh Hussain Taymiyyah, which are Ta'seel, is like Al-Wasatiyah, Al-Hamawiyah, Al-Tadmuriyah. Those works, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he yu'asil manhaj ahl sunnah He's explaining the works of ahl sunnah wal jama'ah. So inshallah, when it comes to that, inshallah, when I explain the book in more details, let's speak about who Ibn Taymiyyah is, so you understand it, you will appreciate the book if you know the person who wrote it. And the value of a work is based on the author, or the one who wrote it, or the one who owns the book. And the Qur'an is the best book sent to mankind, right? Because it's the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is greater than his creation. He's better than his creation. He's superior to his creation. So his words are also more, more superior to the words of any human being. And so 
the scholars from here, they say that the sharaf, the honor of something is connected to the one who said it. If the, the one who said this speech is very honorable, the speech is also very honorable. And so the, the, when you learn Allah wa ta'ala and you know who he is and you study his names and attributes, what do you tend to learn? You, you also start to appreciate the words, the Quran, and the Quran grows in your eyes. That's the same when it comes to walilah al but that's the same thing when it comes to the scholars of Al-Islam. For you to appreciate their works and, and, and to appreciate what they write here, you have to have understanding of who this person is. And that automatically, once you get to know that, you will uh, you'll appreciate what you're reading here. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? Okay, good. So now, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to go to Hayatuhu uh, al-Shakhsiyas, his personal life. And just as a person, who is this man, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, rahimahullah ta'ala, who is he? So, first of all, you have to speak about is, Ismuhu, his name. Oh, by the way, brothers and sisters, there is, there is going to be homework for every week, so inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to set you some homework. It's, this, the homework is going to be sent into the Telegram group, inshallah ta'ala. You have to answer those questions, and then I'll, I'll discuss those questions with you, uh, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, then next week. So I really want students to be engaged, inshallah ta'ala. So to learn his, to know his personal life. So this is personal life. We just want to know Ibn Taymiyyah as a person. Who is he? So if we first have to look at his name and his lineage. He's called Abu Abbas, even though he never, he never married. Okay. There are some scholars who said he did, but it was, yani, uh, he private. That's not strong. Okay, that's not a strong argument. So he's called Abu Abbas. That's a kunya. The Arabs, this Abu, this Abu, Ummu, this Ummu, that is called kunya. The name of this man is his name is Ahmed. He's the son of who? Ibn Abdul Halim. His father is Abd Al Halim. Okay, and his granddad is Abd Salam. Abd Salam. So if anyone asks you Ibn Taymiyyah's name, you say Ahmed. Ibn Taymiyyah's father's name is Abdul Halim. His granddad's name is Abd Salam. So if the most knowledgeable ones are these two. Abd Salam is the author of the kitab, what? Al Muntaqa. You will know that Kitab al muntaqa right? Fi Akhbar al-Mustafa is called. It's the Kitab al muntaqa is authored by Ibn Taymiyyah's granddad, Abd Salam. He wrote this book. And this book is a hadith al-Ahkam. It's like Bulugh al-Maram. It's like what? Bulugh al-Maram. Okay? And the person who explained this book is Muhammad ibn Ali al-Shawkani. He called it Nailu al-Awtar. Does everyone understand that now? So the kitab Nailu al-Awtar that we have is an explanation on the Muntaqa of Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Taymiyyah's granddad. So, are we all together? Um, Ibn Taymiyyah, he is Al Harrani. So, the lineage is Al Harrani. He's a, from a place called Al Harrani. Harran is a place in Syria and he is, then he moved to Damascus so he became a Dimashqi. Ibn Taymiyyah was born in Harran. Okay? Now it's modern in Turkey, correct? Okay? Yes. Then his family ran away from Harran and they ran to where? To Damascus 
from the what? From the Tatar, the Mongolians, right? Is that? But is Ibn Taymiyyah as well known as what? Ibn? He's well known as Ibn Taymiyyah. Scholars said, why is he known as Ibn Taymiyyah? Where did this come from? Why was he called Ibn Taymiyyah? Okay. Some scholars, they said, this name, Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, it came from his, his granddad, her, her, his, his granddad's mother. So his name is what? Ibn Taymiyyah's name is? Um, his name is Ahmed ibn Abdul Halim ibn Abdul Salam. We stop there, right? But then, if we carry on from Abdul Salam, it's Abdul Salam ibn 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 Abdullah ibn Muhammad. So it's Abdul Salam ibn Abdullah ibn Muhammad. This Muhammad, his mother was called Taymiya. Okay, she was called what? Taymiya. And she was what? She was a wa'ira, a woman who used to give heart softening reminders. So the whole entire family became known by her. Are we all together? Ibn Abdul Hadi mentions that in his kitab al uqud al durriya fi ba'di manaqib shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah. Is everyone with me so far? And there are other views. There are what? There are other views. So we've spoken about the first thing, which is Ismuhu wa Nasabuhu. Now we know who his name is. We're going to go into the next point, second point I want to speak about today. Second point about him is, is Mawtinu, his place of residency, wa Mawliduhu, and where he was born. I already mentioned um, Ibn Taymiyyah was born, Mawliduhu means birth. He was born, so the word Mawliduhu means birth. He was born in Harran modern day Turkey, okay? And then he moved from Harran to Dimashq. He moved to Damascus. When the year was what? 667 Hijriya. Okay? All these information, I'm going to test you as it's your homework. So make sure you write this information down, take it, and next week, I'm just going to see if, if, if you can answer these questions, inshallah. Ta'ala. So he ran from Harran and he ran to Damascus, 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 and this was the year. Okay. And where did he run to? Why did he run? Haraban min Jawri Tatar. He was running away from the oppression of the Tatar. Okay. When was he born? Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. He was born 661 Hijriya. Okay? And he was born in the month of Shah Rabi' al Awwal. Okay? And it was on the 10th. Filiyom. Al Ashir. So this is where he was born, six hundred sixty-one. Somebody asked a question. What was the question? Ustad, so when we talk about the nisbah of the Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, which of the two should we say, Dimashqi or Harrani or both? The scholars, when I look at their books, they say. About him, Al Harrani, you they say it, generally speaking. And some scholars they actually say Al Harrani, you thumma dimashqi. Okay? By the way, some people they say Damashq. It's actually not, it's Dimashq. Dimashq. Okay? Dimashq. Off like that. That's how you say it. Okay. Somebody else, somebody else asked a question. Sorry. Ustad, what's Qatar, Ya Ustad? Is that the name of the ruler of Harran? 
uh, have I culture I never mentioned that have I mentioned that is that, is that word I used ha huh. oh Tatar Tatar I said Tatar yes the Tatar I said now the Tatar were the Mon Mongols right they were the Mongols We also hear some scholars say Ibn Taymiyyah al-Hafid. A lot of great scholars used to say that, but it became very common by Sheikh Salah ibn Abdullah ibn Hamad al ushaymi He generally says that a lot. And he wants al-Hafid, he means Ahmed. And when he says Ibn, when he says Ibn Taymiyyah al-Jad, he means Abdi Salam. That's how he distinguishes one from the other. So al-Hafid is the grandson. The grandson is who? Ahmed. The Ibn Taymiyyah. And when he says Ibn Taymiyyah al-Jad, he means Abdi Salam, the author of the Kitab al-Muntaqa, Ibn Taymiyyah's granddad. So some scholars, they do that. They distinguish it in that, in that manner. Okay. So that's me now explaining where his residency was. Mawtinu, I explained it to you. Uh, and Mawlidu, where he was born. And etc. The third thing I want to speak about here, inshallah ta'ala, is Usratuhu, his family. Now, some of you... Take these issues a bit light, but family plays a role in a person's upbringing, right? And Imam al-Dhahabi, rahimahullah, mentions about Ibn Taymiyyah. He says, can about his granddad, uh, his father, sorry, his father, Ibn Taymiyyah's dad. And Imam al-Dhahabi says, about Abdi Salam, Abdi, uh, Abdul Halim, Ibn Taymiyyah's, uh, Dhahabi says about Ibn Taymiyyah's, Ibn Taymiyyah's dad. We said Ibn Taymiyyah's name is Ahmed, Ibn Abdul Halim, right? So Abdul Halim is the father of Ahmed ibn, and Imam, uh, Imam uh, ibn Taymiyyah, right? What did he say about him? Kana uh, imaman. He said he was an imam. Muhaqqiqan. Yani who reached, reached that daraja tahqiq. He said about him kathir. Al-Funun. He was a man who knew many sciences. And then he even said about him, Lahu Yad Ula Fil Farail. He was he had a he had like yani, a long hand means yani, he was deeply rooted into inheritance. And also Al Hisab, maths. He knew it very well. And his father, Ahmed, uh, Abdul Halim, his father. Uh, the Ibn Kathir mentions Ibn Taymi's dad Abdul Halim he ha used to have a chair in Dar Al Hadith Al Sukariya and he's what he used to do was Al Ta'lim Wal Wa'al and he used to teach the people reminder and heart softening and his father passed away 682 Hijriya okay because that's, that's his father so you can understand what kind of family he's from. Let's look at his granddad, Abdul Salam. Abdul Salam, he's known as what was the dar again? The dar was dar al hadith uh, sukriya. Inshallah, Taala, there's a bidni lai kareem. I'm going to do a series, inshallah ta'ala, where I'm going to speak about all the, the door, al-hadith, al-fiqh, and ilm al-shari'a was taught in, in, the, in that land, and the scholars that created it, and how it was taught, and all of it. Inshallah ta'ala, these madaris and these door that were opened, I'm going to make a series of it, and give explanation of it, of, of them, inshallah, if, inshallah ta'ala. One of them is the famous madrasa, madrasa al umariyah the history behind it, where it came from, and who, where it, all of that, I think we should study it and have an understanding of it. He's, this is where he's, uh, his father was a teacher at, and he used to teach uh, Ibn Taymiyyah's dad. Okay? Okay. Now let's go to his granddad. We're still talking about his family. His, dad, his granddad was also given the title of Shaykh al-Islam. His granddad. His granddad is more knowledgeable than his father. 
Okay, the granddad was very knowledgeable. His school is his, his, his name was Majduddin. Okay, Abu Barakat. Okay, and his name is Abdi Salam. Okay. Ibn Shakir al Kutaybi, al Kutubi, he said about him, about uh, Ibn Shakir saying about Abdi Salam, he said, Kana imaman. Abdi Salam was an imam. Hujjah, he was a proof. Bari'an fil fiqh. He was deeply grounded in fiqh wal hadith. Walahu yad tula fil tafsiri. He had a deep understanding of tafsir. Wa ma'rifa tamma fil usul. He also had a يعني deep understanding of usul al-fiqh والاطلاع على مذاهب الناس he also knew the different مذاهب he had, he had con uh, comparative يعني knowledge where he knew the different views out there okay listen to this he says ولم يكن في زمانه مثله there was no one like him at his time وله المصنفات النافعة في الأحكام and he has that famous book I mentioned before which uh, we spoke about it's called المنتقى okay are we all together? Are we all on the same page? So those three people are like the closest. Now some sisters might be in the class and see, you can, okay, what about brothers? Uh, sorry, what about women? Women. Okay, what about the women in the family? Were there women who were scholars? Yes, there were. But let's mention some of the women. His grandmother. I mentioned Muhammad Muhammad ibn al-Khadir if you go back to the name already it's, it's, one, it's, in, the, it's in the name of his granddad Muhammad ibn al-Khadir ibn Muhammad ibn al-Khadir ibn Taymiya his mother we already mentioned her, she was known as Taymiya she, that's where the name came from right she was a wa'ira she used to give reminders and Ibn Abdul Hadi speaks about her in his kitab al-Uqud al durriya he mentions her so that's, a, that's where the name came from. The whole family took the name because of her. Another woman is Zainab uh, bint Abdullahi So I want someone to really tell me who, how this person is related to Ibn Taymiyyah. Who can quickly, inshallah ta'ala, answer how Ibn Taymiyyah is related to this individual. And then I'll talk about who, who she is. So someone said sister of his. No, that's incorrect. Mm -hmm. she's, his, she's his niece. His, Ibn Taymiyyah's brother, Abdullahi, gave birth to Zainab. Okay? Okay? And Abdullahi and Ahmed were brothers. Ahmed is Ibn Taymiyyah. They were brothers. And Zainab is Ibn Taymiyyah's niece. Does that make sense? She was the teacher. Zainab was the teacher of who? Ibn Hajar. She was the teacher of who? Ibn Hajar. Are we all together? Yeah? Hey, naam. Ibn Hajar traveled to Hijaz to, to take knowledge from her. And she gave him Ijazat. And she passed away. Zainab, she, Zainab passed away. 799 Hijriya. Okay? Another thing I want to mention. Uh, are we all together? Are we all on the same page? The fourth thing I want to speak about, inshallah ta'ala, is wafatuhu, his death. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he died when the year was um, 700. Uh, and 28 uh, 
That's when he passed away, rahimahullah ta'ala, 728. Okay, and he died uh, on the 20th of the month of the Hijjah. He died in the prison well known as Qal'at in Dimashq. He was in prison with Ibn Qayyim, his student, and he finished the Quran 83 times. And he died in the ayah, in al Muttaqina fi jannatin wa nahar. In al Muttaqina, in al Muttaqina fi jannatin wa nahar, fi maqadi sidqin in the Maliki Mukutadir Suratu al Qamar. He died in the ayah. Rahimahullah. Uh, they took everything away from him. They took pens from him. They took papers from him. Uh, they didn't want him to write anything. They didn't want him to write any response. Rahimahullah, rahmatan wasi'ah. Okay? Because even when he went into prison, he was still authoring sometimes. He was bringing out books. Like that he's Rad al al ikhna'i, which we're going to talk about if we get time for it. Some of his works. He read it in prison. Al Khna'i didn't like that. As soon as it got written and it came out and it was published, he took it to the ruler and said, How is this man in prison and still writing these things? Okay. The reason why Ibn Taymiyyah was in prison it was because of the influence that the government had was not towards the people of the Sunnah. The government was more inclined to the Asha'ira. And to the mutakallimin. And as we can see, as anyone who's studied Ibn Taymiyyah, read about his biography and his life, will, will know that Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, a statement that an orientalist said, and then Ham, Abdul Razak Hamza, the great scholar of yani, Egypt, uh, then borrowed it from, from the orientalist, was that Ibn uh, Taymiyyah uh, would basically his whole entire purpose was to come to a building. This is how the Orient Orientalists put it. And then all the scholars of Islam after that, they started to take that and use it. Many scholars mentioned said this after this. Abdul, Abdul Zak Hamza said it. Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid said it. Sheikh Al Bani said it. Oh, the majority of scholars, they say this. Even Abdul, Abdul Rahman Yahya al Muallimi says it as well. Ibn Taymiyyah comes to a building. In other words, he comes to ideologies that existed. And what he does is that the building, he smacks it from the side and he smacks it from the other side to make the building stand straight. Are we all together? To take it what? To straighten up the building. He, Ibn Taymiyyah doesn't work towards destroying the building. He corrects the building. He puts it in the right direction. Rahimahullah. Are we all together? Yeah. Does that make sense? And then they said, Ibn Al-Qayyim came and then he took it. He, Ibn al-Qayyim came and he took it brick by brick to, and he to expand on what his teacher what his teacher did and he, Ibn al-Qayyim came after and then he took it bit brick by brick that's what they say am I making sense? so he hit the wall from this side and he hit the wall from this side and he hit the wall from this side from the, court, the sides and the building was straightened up and then that's it that's what Ibn Taymiyyah was rahimahullah rahmatan wasi'ah and so he was seen as a controversial figure. He came out different views, he came out against different issues. He was well outspoken person, very outspoken in when it came to the points that he, he needed to mention. And a person like that, um, people generally don't like to put yeah, I mean, their security into problems. Yeah, I mean, people don't like to lose their security, right? So Sheikh Hussam Taymiyyad, didn't care. So he was in and out of prison, rahimahullah, in and out of prison. He was in. And wallahi, one of the hardest things in life is to be imprisoned. It's really hard to be imprisoned. It's, it's one of the most hardest things that you have to endure, is to go behind bars and to be take, everything taken from you and you're told to stay there. And in there you meet all sorts of people. It's humiliating. It's degrading. But when you look at great scholars of Islam, that's what they went through. Starting from Nabila Yusuf onwards. Okay? 
Now, inshallah ta'ala, I want to speak about Hayatuhu uh, al-Ilmiya. I want to talk about his... By the way, these classes, we're going to literally take them for the two hours that were set. So from 10 until 12, we're going to, we're going to go through it, inshallah ta'ala. Bi'idhnillahi al-Kareem. So bear with me, we're not going to cut these classes short. Because we're going to take every information that you need, inshallah ta'ala. So before I move on to the next part, which is his educational background, has everyone understood what I said about his personal life? And have you learned new things about Ibn Taymiyyah that you didn't know? So I hope, inshallah ta'ala, this can be an inspiration for all of us, inshallah ta'ala, that we benefit from this type of person. We, that Allah makes him an inspiration for us and that we... Okay. Now I'm, I'm going to talk about his educational, uh, 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 Ibn Taymiyyah's educational upbringing. Rahimahullah wa rahmatan wa sa'a. As I mentioned before, Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimahullah, where did he grow up in? Ibn Taymiyyah grew up in a household of knowledge. It's like he's from a family of knowledge. Okay. Um, يعني, scholars they mention يعني, يعني, at his baby steps he was he was studying. But there were factors that the Shaykh Rahimahullah had. And the scholars they call these things that the, they see, you see is called an najaba. An najaba. You're gonna see that term a lot. And in najaba means when you have a child and you see something in him, like it's just sharp, fast, and in these, these, and in these qualities were seen about Ibn Taymiyyah at a very young age. From the things that were seen from him was al-jid, or ijtihad. Hardworking. And a very hardworking person. He loved perfection, rahimahullah, loved perfection. ولذلك if you go to the kitab al-alam al-aliya by al-barzali he said am al-bazzar sorry he said wa lam yazal iban as-sighrihi at a young age ibn taymiyyah was what mustaghriq al-awqat fi al-jidd wa al-ijtihad he spent his time in working hard and exerting effort that's generally not present in a lot of the young kids right when they love to play around so this is a this is something that caught his family's attention at a young age, this boy's working hard, exerting effort, cutting away from the little kids. Even a story was mentioned that when he was young, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, his family went out to go uh, to Nusha. Yeah, and he go out, uh, as you know, Dimashq was, was, was uh, the Dimas Damascus was, was governed by the Romans and they built it very well. So there was greenery. It's not like how Hijaz is. The Arabian Peninsula is deserts. Like his sham had gardens and it was well built, beauty. So his family, his father and his family, they made a decision to one day go to the, you know, the beach and stay there and enjoy themselves. And he refused to go, rahimahullah, rahmatan wa si'ah. He said, I'm not going to go, I'm going to stay back. And whilst they were out there and enjoying themselves, he, rahimahullah, was spending his time benefiting and studying and learning. So when they came back, his family, they said to him, look, you missed out. We had fun. You didn't have fun. And he said, oh, I I did this whilst you guys were away. I read this book. And this was when he was young. Imagine that. Very young kid. He didn't like playing with the kids. He did not like playing with kids. This is not only to him. Even Nawawi was like that as well. Great scholars of Islam were like that. So that's the first quality, which is al-jidd wal ijtihad. Brothers and sisters, these qualities, they carry on in your life. They do. These little things, take it on board. If you see your child like that, you know, take that as a sign that you can do something with your child. The second is uh, Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, yani razaqahullah. Allah gave Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, a dhakirah. Allah gave him al-dhakiratul hadda. So the first one was 
الجد والاجتهاد سو ان شاء الله تعالى ام جون الجد والاجتهاد مينز انثوزيازم اند ديديكيشن سو يا ديديكيشن رحمه الله واز ديديكيتد يعني هارد وركينج انديفيدوال يعني this is as a child we're not talking about somebody in his in his, his teens or even older than that and he, even before he reached the age of 10 hard working person the second quality that he had was razaqahu allah allah gave to him al dhakira al hadda ibn taymiyah's brain was was unique it was unique yani it was it's what the scholars refer to as al aql al mutayaqqad his his brain was awake was alert And you, if you have children, you'll see that some children are alert. Little information and little details they keep it in their heads, and they remember it. At a very early age, this was seen in Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah taala. So this gave birth to some great qualities that he had, rahimahullah, from this. Um, Surah Al Hifz, so he could memorize a lot. And in Islam, brothers. Our religion it stands on two pillars when you want to study is hifdun and al fah. You have to memorize and you have to understand. Yes, of course, of course, of course, of course. You can't learn Islam without memorizing and also understanding what you memorized. So what happens to so many people today? Subhanallah, is that the Western academic way of studying is just understand, understand. Rarely do you memorize. And so some people, because they've grown up in the West, that's what they've become. And so it's when they start practicing the Deen, and they take the religion serious, they still have that attitude of just listening. And so they have a lot of information in their heads, but they've not memorized anything. Do you guys see where I'm coming from here? And if have have you do you feel like you fell into that? Yeah, so you, you go to school. My, I remember when I was studying university, I was studying linguistics, right? And the teacher was teaching us linguistics. Uh, the teacher was teaching us linguistics. You know, you this guy should know the English language very well. He's a linguist, right? You know, he's a PhD linguist. Sometimes he would ask us like words like necessary. How do you spell it? You know, you know like it's. You look at students and say, "How do you spell it?" And it's little things like that, I picked up and on. I was like, "Ajib." Like no memorization, but that man's understanding was unique. He understood so much. So, Islam is not like that. Islam is hevdun ma'alfa. You walk into a room, you you can talk and explain things and discuss things and have yani something to say without yani yani looking at looking at somewhere. funny because when you go to the eastern when you go to the east like yeah the, the subcontinent for example india and etc or you go to the middle east or you go to africa when they study academic sciences they memorize everything and they do that right they memorize uh, a dictionary i remember in my in my experience when i went to my home country uh, at the age of 14 i traveled back to my country And I had seen a boy who'd memorized the dictionary. He literally memorized Oxford Dictionary. I'm not joking. He literally memorized it, and I was shocked because <laughs> the dictionary gets updated, new words are added, words are subtracted, and are omitted. So I was like, "What edition did you memorize?" But the point is, they memorize textbooks. They memorize definitions. They memorize. So it is present. The people. So. What I'm trying to say is that those who studied in the East, or the Middle East, or in Africa, they learn from a young age the importance of memorization. So when they study, they give so much importance to memorization and little understanding. The West, like in, they give no importance to memorization, importance to understanding, and so you have this side of the world memorizing everything without having no understanding or little understanding, and you have the West. Not really memorizing anything, but what understanding things. So, if we had to choose between the two, which one is better, to memorize or to understand, without a shadow of a doubt, if we have to choose, yes, it's better to understand than to memorize, right? 
But why do we have to choose? Why do we have to choose? Does that make sense? Why don't you just memorize as a, as a person, right? So that's not what I want to talk about now. I don't want to talk about memorization and how to memorize. I've spoken about this so many times, things that can help you memorize. Recently, my last class that I gave in Kelima, uh, and if the Dora in me that I just finished now, the last part, I so sp- spoke about six ways of, six things that will help you memorize. Do you want me to, do you guys want me to say it now or are you guys going to go there and see it for yourself? Or shall, shall, I, shall, I tell you, shall I tell you guys now? It's, it's totally up to you guys. Oh yeah. If you, okay. Uh, write it down inshallah ta'ala. There's six things that help a person memorize. Number one, ikhlas, ikhlas from niyyah, sincerity. What did Abdullah ibn Abbas say? Abdullah ibn Abbas and he said that a person will attain knowledge in accordance to their intention. Abdullah ibn Abbas said, A person will attain knowledge in accordance to their intention. So if you have good intention, you will, you will go far inshallah ta'ala, brothers and sisters. Ikhlas niyyah, perfect your intention. Come with good intention. Number two, al bu'du, distance yourself from what sins. Al bu'du an al maasi. We all know the the, the poetry of Al Imam Shafi'i, right? Shakotu ila wakiyin bi surah hifdi farshadni ila tarki al maasi wa qala inna al ilma nuru wa nuru la ina al maasi. The poetry is that Shafi'i, who was into memorization, who memorized a lot, felt that his memorization was decreasing and right, reducing. He wasn't, he wasn't able to memorize as much as he used to be able to. So he came to his teacher, Waqi ibn Jarrah al and he said, Shaykh, Shaykh, I am... Uh, by the way, some people, they question whether Shafi'i met Waqi ibn Jarrah al and all of this. The qissa, ya ikhwa, is mashhoorun. You have to understand some things we have to just accept. If something has become mashhoor, yani the ulama have mentioned, يعني, we don't do niqash of the istifada. Something that's common, very well common established. We leave it. As long as it doesn't cause يعني, any controversial, يعني, impermissible things. Okay? Istifada means to benefit. It's to benefit. It's to benefit. So the third is. Uh, so Shafi'i went to his teacher Waqi ibn Jarrah al Ru'asi and he said to Shaki, I, My memorization is becoming bad. I'm, I'm trying to memorize. I'm not able to memorize as much as I used to. I'm struggling. So he told him, Stay away from sins. Sins extinguish that, that fire burning within you to learn. And I, li the reality of every one of us here can testify to that, right? We see it on a day to day basis how uh, it affects us. Uh, sins, how it affects our lives, how it affects us, everything. The third one is ta'weed. Ta'weed wal nafs. You have to get in a habit. Brothers and sisters, ta'weed wal nafs ya al hifd. You have to get into the routine of memorizing. Like, you, the more you push yourself to memorize, the more you start seeing yourself memorizing, right? The brain is like the stomach. The stomach, the more you eat, the more it asks for. Does that make sense? Yeah? If a person eats a lot, the body will ask for more. The brain is the same. The brain, when you memorize more, it wants more. It will take more and it will take more and you start to expand your brain like that. Am I making sense? Yeah, brothers. So train yourself. Get into the habit of memorizing things. For example, for example, get in the habit of you hear some things so often, just memorize those little things. Memorize it, it's important things. Get in the habit of memorizing, especially things that are important to you. So for example, a lot of us don't even get it. For example, we don't, we don't even know our number, our mobile number. That's us just being lazy not to memorize anything. Or two or three people whose numbers are very important to us in our life. We need it. If we didn't have our phone, we need to call them. Does that make sense? Get yourself in the habit of memorizing things. Rely on your brain. Of course, start with what's most important to memorize, but just get yourself in the habit of memorizing. Number four, 
The fourth thing that helps you is al mudakara. You have to have a partner when it comes to memorization. You have to have what? You have to have a partner, someone who listens to your memorization. Okay? You have to have someone. That person can hear your mistakes, your incur like what you're saying is wrong, or is this right what you're saying? Are you memorizing the wrong parts and sections? You need someone to hear you out. How many times have we memorized something and then someone came up to us and said, say, say that again? No. So find someone. Number five is kathratu at-takrar. You have to repeat a lot. Okay? Lil mahfouf. What you're memorizing, you have to repeat it, brothers and sisters. And Imam al-Bukhari, when he was asked about the cure for, 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 for memorization, they said to him, uh, Bukhari, do you know a medication a person can take to help with memorization? Bukhari said, I don't know anything other than two things. The drive and the will of a person and kathratu takrar, repetition. Those are the two things I know, he said. Are we all together, brothers and sisters? Are we all on the same page? Repetition is vital. That repetition, brothers and sisters, is two types. There is a repetition in one moment, in one go. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm speaking about repetition in, 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 in two different days. Three, separate it, divide it into different days. And last but not least, is the sixth is ikhtiyar, choosing. Uh, as the man choosing the time well uh, makan al munasibaini the sixth one is choosing the time and the place that's befitting are we all together some people they want to memorize in the living room, whilst the family members are running around and this person is talking about this topic and another person's on the mobile phone, you, memor you want to memorize that? You have to choose your places wisely, brothers and sisters. Have a room with no writings on the wall, yeah, any plain room, etc. This room is for memorization, for instance. Or the corner of your room where you sit down, and you have a chair, and you sit there and you face the wall. Zaman is place, oh, sorry, time. You can't memorize it at Dhuhr time when you've been working all day and no, it's not, not going to be, you're tired, your body's tired, your brain is fried. So if you want to memorize it's best to do it, what? Just before, one hour before Fajr, one hour after Fajr, until Salatul Duha, that's a good time. Memorize a portion of the Quran before you go to work. One or two ayahs, no problem. Two or three hadiths. Khalas. So those are the six, inshallah ta'ala, the point is not, I'm not trying to talk about that now. That wasn't what I was meant to talk about. I spoke about and expanded on all these six in that series. So inshallah ta'ala, you can go there. Let's come back to Shaykh Hussam Taymiyyah's life. So I mentioned two things Ibn Taymiyyah Allah gave him. The first one was at a young age, al jid wal ijtihad. He was a very hardworking, dedicated, hardworking individual. The second one is razaqahullahu dhakarat al hadda. Allah gave this man something, a brain, a brain and a, and a strong brain which gave birth to fast in memorizing, okay? Also, what he had was it would be hard for him to forget things. And these two brothers and sisters, are they are the trickiest part. Some people, they can memorize fast, but they forget fast. And some people, they memorize slowly, but they keep it they keep it long. For Allah to give you this one and this one together, that's a rare commodity. So brothers and sisters. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you guys do you guys understand do you understand where I'm coming from?
who thinks they, they have both? Allah has given them both. So if you've got both, just say both so we can see how many people have that. Who's got both? They can memorize fast and they rarely forget. Now don't write one. Just If you've got both, just write both. Now we'll come to the people who've only, who've only got one, but I just want to see if there's anyone in this room who's got both. I guess we don't have anyone, right? I definitely don't have both. Okay, good, 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 good. MashaAllah, good. Uh, who memorizes fast? Who, who can memorize fast, but is slow? Uh, sorry, they memorize fast, but they don't, they, they, you mem, who, who memorize it? No, okay. Who memorizes it fast, <laughs> but takes time to forget it? No, oh, sorry, that was wrong. That mean that would mean both, right? So, who memorizes fast? Who memorizes fast, but quickly forgets? Who memorizes fast and forgets quickly? Marshall, that's a gift, Allah Mabari. Let's read. So if say number one, if you memorize fast, but you forget quickly, just say that. So number one, number one. Okay, Allah Mabari. Good. MashaAllah, Allah Mabari. Allah Mabari. Who takes time to memorize? It, it's not easy for it to go into your brain. But once it does, it's locked. <laughs> Who's got number two? Say number two. Allahumma barik. Okay, who's who's good at memorizing uh, numeric? Not good at memorizing numbers, but not not words. Who's good with not saying number? So just write number one. If you easily memorize let, numbers, you're good with numbers. You can memorize numbers quickly, but you can't memorize words. You're not. It's not. It's not easy for you to memorize literally any words, but it's numbers you can. Okay, and who's Okay, and, and and say number two if you can memorize uh, words and not uh, numbers. And number three, uh, if you both of them is easy, it's the same for you. You can do both. There's a, okay, I'm I'm bad when it comes to numbers. So I can't. I well, I don't think I will never ever. I don't think I'll ever remember numbers. So I, I lack numbers. And I would probably fall into those who uh, memorize slow, but keeps it for a while. Yeah, I'll, it takes me time to memorize. And uh, it will take me time to memorize something. And it will be easy for me, it will be hard. And I won't forget it. Yeah, that's, that's but it'll take time for me to memorize it. So Alhamdulillah, you see, if you know these things, it helps you, Allah, it really does help you. Because what, if you know that you, you will re retain this for a long time, so you you appreciate that, you know that, that time you're just pushing in and pushing in, you know, like I know a brother, I said to him, which one are you, you, you memorize fast and it takes you time to forget it? It stays in your long memory or does it not? He said, I don't know. So maybe if you put yourself in one of those categories, you can you can appreciate it. So he said, you know what? I know what I am. I said, what is it? He said, it takes me time to memorize. It's like, I, I can't memorize fast, but I don't easily forget. So I said, okay, now it won't hurt you when you know every time you're memorizing, even though it's not fast, you're, you're memorizing it, but you know it's going to be there for, for, for a long time. So it, it won't stress you out. Does that make sense? 
And Allah Barik, he, he felt better, and, he's, and, he, and he went for it, and he did, he did a better job. Uh, so anyways, Allah gave Ibn Taymiyyah both, which is rare. It's rare that people have that. Allah gave him both, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he had that fast memorization, and he, it was slow for him to forget. Okay? Another thing Allah gave Ibn Taymiyyah, which is the third thing, which is Al-Fahmu. Okay, understanding. There are two ways, brothers and sisters, to understand, right? Sah? Am I making sense? In order to understand, you, there's two ways to understand. It helps our understanding. The first one is Hilaqut Tadris. Hilaqut Tadris means circles of knowledge. Go in there and t take, sitting under the feet of a teacher and him teaching you, this gives you understanding. And the second one is Al-Qira'ah. The more you read, the more you understand. Am I making sense, brothers and sisters? Yeah? Ha. Ibn Taymiyyah, his memorization and his understanding were the same. And that's again rare. Who's good at understanding and slow in memorization? Number one. I'm good at understanding things, but I'm slow in memorizing. Yeah, that's the majority of people, right? Who's good at memorizing things and understanding is not for me. I don't understand things quickly. So can I ask for something? I'm, I just want to see uh, students, okay? Those who said understanding is easy for them, can you repeat the answer and write what, what, what country you're from? Just want to show you guys something. The people who said understanding is their strong, just write the country that you're in. Okay, good. So you can see a lot of the people. So how many people do we have? We've got France, two, two, sorry, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, nine. So nine people have said they're from the West. So people from the West generally like to understand things. Hevd is not all important like that. Does that make sense? So you tend to see that. Now, the people whose memorization is what they, is easier for them, their understanding, write down what country, what, 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 where you're from. Saudi Arabia, UAE, Middle East, UK, okay? India, okay? US, number two. <sighs> India. Somaliland, okay, good. So do you see the people from the West is less in number? So we have, we've got one person, two, two people who from the, from the West who said that memorization is best, is easier for them. That's something I've seen with people from the West. You understand my point? People from the West will tell you it's memorization is, is my understanding is better for me. Cause that's how we've, We've grown up in the West. And those people who are from Africa, from the subcontinent, the Middle East, they'll tell you, Hivl is what's easier for me. And that's something, Jarribu. Try it. Ask your family members, Fam or Hivl. They'll say Hivl, who are from the Middle East or countries like that. You'll see that. Brothers and sisters, inshallah ta'ala, this is who Shaykh al Islam Taymi was in terms of, uh, as, a, as his, 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 his yani, Nash'atu al Ilmiya. I want to conclude by Ibn Taymiyyah's life here. Just one more thing, inshallah ta'ala, which is his shuyukh. Before I go to his shuyukh, um, because what were the two things I just mentioned right now? 
that a person needs to understand. I mentioned, I mentioned how many things? If you want your understanding to be very strong, you need two things. What, what did I say? What were the two things I mentioned? Circles of knowledge and reading. Very good. Circles of knowledge and reading. Ibn Taymiyyah, they said, Rahimahullah, he one day sat down. Imagine this, yeah, brothers and sisters. Like, really, imagine this. Uh, Ibn Abdul Hadi mentions this. Okay. Uh, he one day took the kitab of Sibawihi. <laughs> Please, brothers and sisters, listen to this. And Ibn Taymiyyah, without a teacher, took the kitab of Sibawihi, which is known as <laughs> Al Kitab. It's, it's, it's out there, it's present. Kitab Sibawihi is present. You can find it and you can buy it and see it. It's complicated for anyone to understand it. It's very, 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 very complicated book to understand. The Kitab of Siba Wai, because it's not just Arabic grammar. There is all types of the Arabic language. The 12 sciences of the Arabic language are all mentioned in there by Siba Wai, rahimahullah. Even though the Kitab is mainly grammar, but it talks about philology, it talks about semantics, it talks about morphology, it, different types of language. It, it discusses it in there. Ibn Taymiyyah grabbed that book and read it and understood it. So that shows you his understanding was something else. Are we all together? As for him studying with the teachers, I'm going to mention here, his teachers reached 200. My voice cut out. What I was saying was that Ibn Taymiyyah sat down and he read the Kitab Sibawihi. He read it. And he what? Ibn Abdul Hadi mentions in his Kitab Al-Uqud al -Durriya. He says he read it and he understood it. He understood the kitab inside out. Even this was, <laughs> this was the issue where him and Ibn, uh, uh, there was an issue that happened between him and Abu Hayyan al-Andalusi, rahimahullah. Abu Hayyan loved Ibn Taymiyyah at the beginning, right? They were very close and he loved him. Very good relationship between the two of them. Until one day, Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah must have taken an approach in an Arabic ruling. And Ibn Hayyan was sitting there. And he heard Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah take the opinion in the grammatical ruling in a certain way. And Abu Hayyan went over to Ibn Taymiyyah and said to him, basically the view that you've taken uh, and the approach that you've taken goes against the view of uh, Siba Wihi. And before that, Abu Hayyan loved Ibn Taymiyyah, extremely loved him. He wrote even poetry in praising Ibn Taymiyyah. So Ibn Taymiyyah said to him, uh, yani, uh, Sibawai is not a prophet And Abu Hayyan loved Sibawai Abu Hayyan is a grammarian he's, he's the imam who wrote the tafsir kitab So he loved it. Uh, What's it called uh, He loved Sibawai Excessively And then he said to him Ibn Taymiyyah I've read the kitab Al kitab by Sibawai and he mentioned a number of mistakes that he came across. Ibn Taymiyyah saying this. I came across in that kitab. لا يعرفه سيبا وي سيبا وي he doesn't know that he did that mistake. And you don't know it. And he was a bit... يعني, Ibn Hayyan felt Ibn Taymiyyah was very harsh in his words. Does that make sense? And Dhabi did mention that about Ibn Taymiyyah. There was a hidda in his speech. Like when he spoke, it was a bit tough in his words. This made Ibn Hayyan al-Andulusi excessively angry with Ibn Taymiyyah and he left his gathering and he then he started writing poetry against him uh, and uh, yani speaking against Ibn Taymiyyah. Okay? But that kitab, Al Kitab, Ibn Taymiyyah wrote it, I'm read it, yani, uh, sorry, he read it and he understood it. Isti'ab. Now I'm going to go into his teachers. He had 200 teachers. Imagine that. From his teachers were uh, Ahmed ibn Abdul Da'im al Maqdisi, who's known as Musnad al Sham. I'm just, I can't mention all, all these shuyukhs that he took from, but I'm going to mention Ahmed. I'm going to mention the most prominent ones. Ahmed ibn Abdi Daim al Maqdisi. He was the Musnad of Sham. He was the Faqih of Sham, the Muhaddith of Sham. That's what they called him. He, ibn Taymiyyah took from him. Okay. Um, Taqiyuddin Ismail ibn Ibrahim Abul Yusr, who's also known as Musnad al Sham, Ibn Taymiyyah took from him. Rahimahullah rahmatan. 
uh, Wasi'a. If you want to know all of his teachers that he studied, studied with and took knowledge from and benefited from, you can go to, and you can find it in the Kitab Al-Uqud Al-Durriya Fi Ba'di Manaqib Shaykh Al-Islam Taymiyyah by Ibn Abdul Hadi. Okay? There are many more. You can find it yourself. Uh, it's all there, inshallah. Ta'ala. So I'm just going to only mention يعني, three of them here for your own benefit, inshallah. Ta'ala. So one is Ahmed ibn Abdul Daim al Maqdisi. He's very powerful. You, you'll see him in Kutub al Hadith. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah took from him. Uh, rahimahullah. Uh, rahimahullah. From the people he took from Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, is Al Majd ibn Asakir. Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Usman ibn Mudaffar ibn Hibatullah al Dimashqi. The third person, inshallah ta'ala, that he took from uh, is his father, his own father, Abdul Halim ibn Abd Salam. Okay. Uh, even Ismail ibn Abi Abdullah ibn al Asqalani and others, he took from many people. His students are many, Ibn Taymiyyah. Okay. Um, and Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he took from him. Uh, so now we, we, we spoke about the people who took from. Uh, the people took from, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, the people that Ibn Taymiyyah took from. And now, somebody asked a question. Let me just check the question. So somebody asked a question. Uh, the song, is there, is there, is that the one who wrote Tabiyun al-Kadhi bin Muftari? La, 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 la. This Ibn Asakir Ahmed Al Majid Ibn Asakir here is not the Ibn Asakir. The other Ibn Asakir is Abu Qasim, Ali Ibn Hassan, and he died five hundred and seventy something. So he, no, 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 Ibn Taymiyyah wasn't even born when Ibn Asakir. There's a big distance between the two of them, very big distance. No, no, it's another one. It's another one. Okay. Um. Yeah, his students. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah that studied with him and took knowledge from him are many from those well known is uh, Ibn Al-Qayyim al Josia, who is one of the most famous well known students of his okay um, from his students is the uh, uh, so I'm gonna the first one is Ibn Al-Qayyim The second one is Al Alai. Al Alai, this man, Salahuddin Khalil ibn Al Amir, Saifuddin uh, ibn Abdullah Al Alai al Kaykeldi, the one who wrote the Kitab Qawaid al Muthib, Wajmu al Muthab, Fi Qawaid al Madhab. This Kitab, I always tell people, buy that Kitab, brothers. The Tabah Kuwait, the Wizarat al Awqaf of Kuwait, to publish it. This Kitab is in Qawaid al Fiqhiya. Powerful kitab because Al Ala is a muhaddith and a faqih shafi'i. Okay, and a usuliyun. That kitab is something else, brothers. So buy that kitab and read it. It's as powerful as the qawaid of Ibn Rajab al Hanbali. Probably to me personally, even better. Personally to me, it's even better than the kitab of Ibn Rajab al Hanbali. That's my personal opinion. I've looked at both of them. The third student of Ibn Taymiyyah that's well known is Al Imam Dhabi. Okay, the kitab of, can I repeat the book? Yeah, it's called Majmu' uh, al-Muthab. Fi Qawaid al-Madhab. This kitab, Al-Ala'i rahimahullah, yani Qawaid mentions in there powerful Qawaid, and I, I like it. He gives the Qawaidah and he gives examples, furu' that come out of that Qawaidah. Ya ikhwa, your eyes open. And his ilm of hadith is something else. He's a student of Shaykh Al-Sam Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, rahmatan, uh, wasi'a. By the way, brothers, you can see Shafi'is are learning from Hanabila, Hanabila learning from Shafi'iyah, Hanafiya. This is, it was there, it was there. It was there, they were learning from uh, one, and, one, and, one, and, one another. And they're becoming 
يعني او الاسلام يعني ذيس تعصب ستارت كم ليتر بيبل ستارت كوبيلا ان لايف فروم هي ستودنتس ابن تيميه از الامام ابن كثير اند ماني اذر بيبل فروم هي ستودنتس from the people that benefited from him you can't necessarily call him the student of Ibn Taymiyyah but benefited from Ibn Taymiyyah as well يعني in their discussions and their dialogues as well is Abul Hajjaj al-Mizzi <coughs> and Ibn Taymiyyah benefited from also Abul Hajjaj al-Mizzi as well they benefited from one another okay uh, so and you can find Ibn Taymiyyah students and who, to, who he took from and who took from him and all of them you can find that Uh, in uh, يعني many many different places inshallah uh, so i mentioned ibn kathir as well he studied with him and ibn abdul hadi uh, alimuddin al barzali and others they they all studied with ibn taymiyyah so now we studied ibn taymiyyah rahimahullahu rahmatan wasi'ah we know who he is right now inshallah everyone has an understanding of him I just want to I want to give this topic a justice so if you all don't mind I'm just going to speak about Ibn Taymiyyah in the ulum al-shari'ah like in his ulum al-shari'ah but I I've over the years been writing about Ibn Taymiyyah he's one person I love I love him dearly subhanahu rahimahullah ta'ala I love him dearly so much and I've written about his life whether it be from the angle of his knowledge whether it be his ibadat whether it be his yani his يعني effects that he has on people and how much works have been written about his life. يعني Ibn Taymiyyah over 200 books have been written about his life in just the Muslim world. Okay? And what has been written in the West and all that, if you put that together, we're talking about thousands of works that have been PhDs and masters and in di- direct or indirect have been written about him. Rahimahullah, rahmatan wa siya. He's an F- he, has, he changed so many things. He's a character and an individual that plays a role in يعني in the life of the mutaakhirin anyways i want to speak about ibn taymi in some of the ulum al-shari'a and al ulum al-shar'iyah ibn taymi in al aqida so i want to speak about his so ibn taymi has written works in the uh, aqida his biggest works and his big books in this issue is the kitab dar'u ta'arud al-aql wal naql And his kitab, Talbis al-Jahmiyyah. And another kitab, Al-Istiqama. And another kitab known as Al-Safatiyah. And another kitab, Minhaj al-Sunnah al-Nabawiyyah. Those five books I've mentioned are like the big bo- aqidah books of his, where he refutes different groups that oppose the methodology of the Salaf. In those books I just mentioned, Dar'u Ta'arud al-Aqli wal-Naqal. So the first kitab is his kitab, Dar, I'm not going to finish the whole name, دار تعارض العقل والنقل هيز كتاب تلبيس تلبيس الجهمية نمبر ثري هيز كتاب الاستقامة الصفدية أن هيز كتاب منهج As-Sunnah and Nabawiyah. Those five books, Ibn Taymiyyah's vast knowledge of Al-Aqidah and the views of the deviated groups, are, they're clear in these five works. Am I making sense, brothers and sisters? These five books you will not understand unless you've studied three books of his. Al-Wasitiyah, Al-Hamawiyya and Al-Tadmuriyya. The last one is Al-Tadmuri, which is the one we're taking now. You don't take these three books and you start opening those five books. Brothers, you're, you're going to confuse yourself and you're going to not know what you're talking about and you're going to harm yourself and you're going to harm the people. Am I, making me, am I making sense here or am I not? Ibn Taymiyyah here is refuting, he's speaking against who? He's speaking about number one, Al-Jahmiyyah. In those five books. Number two, he's speaking about Al-Mu'tazila. 
And we're going to talk about these groups, the deviated groups. Number three, he's speaking about the uh, Al-Khawarij and the Murji'ah. And he's talking about the fourth group, which is a Shia. Okay. And the Shia. He knew their usul, their foundations that they were built on. He knew the foundations. So he ripped their foundations up. Are we all together? If anyone studies al wasatiyah and then al hamawiyah and then al tadmuriyah Okay. Some people are saying, what about the Asha'ira? The Asha'ira... The refutation of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah on the, in the Asha'ira comes in the three books, Al-Wasatiya, al hamawi and Al-Tidmuri, especially the Tidmuriya. We're going to take it, inshallah ta'ala. He, he touches on them here. Okay, we're going to see how he touches on them here. Like in these five books, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he really comes to groups that he hasn't really come to as much. He comes to the Khawarij and the Mu'tazil and the Murji and the Shia and Jamia. And he, the difference here is this kitab is a ta'seel. These books are ta'seel. These three books. And you asil. He gives you what you should know as a, as a person of the sunnah. I mean, his sunnah, what you need to know. And here is a rudud. Brothers, you can't understand refutations unless you have ta'seel, right? Does that make sense? Am I making sense here? And Imam al what did he say about him? About Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah when it came to the groups? He said about him, he said, Arafa aqwal al-mutakallimin. He knew the views of the mutakallimin. Ahlul kalam. Wa radda alayhim and he refuted them. Bal qara'a kutub al-falasifa. Rather, he read the books of the philosophers. Wa ahlul mantiq. Wa ahata biha. He said he encompassed it in understanding. Imagine that, brothers. Um... وَرَدَّ عَلَيْهَا فِي كُتُبِي And he refuted them. No, sorry, that was the kalam of Al-Bazzar, sorry. Dhabi's kalam is عَرَفْ أَقْوَالَ الْمُتَكَلِّمِينَ وَرَدَّ عَلَيْهِمْ وَنَبَّهَ عَلَىٰ خَاطَئِهِمْ Ibn Taymiyyah pointed out their mistakes. وَحَذَّرَ مِنْهُمْ And he warned against them. وَنَاصَارَ السُنَّةِ He gave victory to the sunnah. بِأَوْضَحِ حُجَجْ وَأَبْهَرِ بَرَاهِينَ With the clearest evidences and the clearest proofs, Ibn Taymiyyah once a person finishes those th these three books, Al Wasatiya, Al Hamawi, and Al Tadmuriya, you finish that, right? Then you read these five books. Okay, you study these five books. And of course, you study all the other sciences, the Arabic language, and etc., like that. You now can read those five books. Once you finish these five books, there's other books left for you, like Al Raddu Al Mantiqiyin, which is the third level of Ibn Taymiyyah, which is number one, Al Raddu Al Mantiqiyin. And the second kitab is Al-Jawab Al-Suhih. Okay? That he, Rahimahullah, he had written. So you read that, that's the second patch of works that you read from Ibn Taymiyyah in Aqeedah. You're on a level of the works of Shaykh Al-Islam Taymiyyah and knowing who he is, his methodology, now you can go and read his As-Sawalat, his Mujmu' Al-Fatawa, and this and that. Very, very well and benefit from it. Okay, brothers and sisters. Um, I've spoken about him from, in terms of Aqeedah. In Islamic sciences, I've spoken about him in Aqeedah. I want to speak about him in terms of Fiqh. Oh no, Hadith, Hadith, Hadith. Okay. Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimahullah, as Al-Imam al-Dahabi said about him, كان عجيما في معرفة علم الحديث When it came to, which is the second science, Al-Hadith. When it came to Hadith, he said, كان عجيما في معرفة علم الحديث. Dahabi is an Imam of Hadith, right? He said, فأما حفظه متون الصحاح Like how he memorized the wordings of the Hadith. وغالب متون السنن والمسند فما رأيت من يدانيه في ذلك أصلا Dahabi said, I never saw anyone like him. رحمه الله تعالى Imagine that, brothers. We are struggling Somebody asked me a good question. They said, what is the, what is the ta'seel and what is rudud? Ta'seel means grounding yourself. The books that teach you how to ground yourself in what you should believe as a Muslim. That is those three books, Al-Wasatiyah, Al-Hamawiyah, and Al-Tadmuriyah. Those three books, 
they teach you how to ground yourself upon the right methodology. Ar-Rudud is a refutation of the opponents and what they've said. Because uh, it's not enough for a person to just know what is for you. We're in a world today, subhanAllah, where doubts have been thrown at you from all corners. So just studying what is for you is not going to be enough to, to, to protect yourself. So, from that angle, you learn what is against you. So you read the refutations that Ibn Taymiyyah wrote, rahimahullah, and those are the five books that you study. I will never t advise anybody to read the philosophers' works and the innovators' works from their works, from their books, without getting the answers straight away. That's why I said re read the works of Ibn Taymiyyah. Because they bring their doubts is written there and the answer of Ibn Taymiyyah is already there for you straight away. So the doubt doesn't settle in your heart. Does that make sense? Coming back to the hadith. Okay. Coming back to Ibn Taymiyyah's knowledge of hadith. Idhahabi said about him, hadith. He was a fascinating individual when he came to the hadith. He, the mutun of the hadith. The mutun of the hadith. Um... Of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, his knowledge of the mutun of the hadith, it's something else. Are we all together brothers and sisters? Yani, he was uh, powerful. What does mutun al-hadith mean? Yani, he, he was very good when it came to the riwayat of the hadith. Yani, the riwayat of the hadith. Wafi lafti kada wa kada. Wafi lafti kada wa kada. Wafi lafti kada. Somebody asked a question. as -Safadiyya. I can't read the fourth book clearly. Can you please repeat it? The fourth book is the as Sorry, as -Safadiyya. The Kitab as is a refutation on the Falasifa, which they said when it came to the Mu'jizat al-Anbiya. They said that the Mu'jizat, the miracles of the Prophets, is a Qawiyyu Nafsaniyya. It just means that the person, they have a very strong energy within them. Okay, and also another concept known as the biqidam al-alam, that the world has always been. Yani the world was always there. Does that make sense? So Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, biqidam al-alam, and nafyu sifat he's refuting them in there. And he's also responding to this mu'jizat al-anbiya. So this is Kitab al safadiyah That's what he deals with. And it was a question, by the way, that was put to him to, 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 to it was a question he was asked. Uh, and someone tried to refute him on it, and he wrote this Kitab al safadiyah don't worry, inshallah ta'ala. One day I'll take time out to speak about each book of his and the different publications and the best taba'ah to get. The only taba'ah I know of the Kitab al safadiyah out there so far is the Tahqiq of Muhammad, Dr. Muhammad Salim. Uh, originally, it's, it's the Maktaba of Salim Agha in uh, Istanbul published it in the beginning uh, under, the, under, the, under the naming Qa'idat fi al-Haqiqati wa risalat wa ibtari qawli ahli zandakati wa dalala. It came out as that name. And then later, uh, when, it, when uh, يعني, uh, Abdullah ibn Abdul Rahman al-Sa'd and Abu Abdullah al-Hulaymi and another person, they stood up and they corrected the mistakes that were in uh, Muhammad. Oh no, Muhammad Rashad Salim, after him, يعني, they, they authored it, sorry. So they corrected some of the mistakes that were in it. Again, I've been taken off topic. I'm, 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 I, don't, I, don't, I don't I want to focus on each point. Sorry, I don't want to lose track and I don't want to confuse you guys. My time's about to finish and I just want to, uh, inshallah ta'ala, focus on this point. Uh, what was I saying? What was I saying? Hadith. So he's, he's, he was a fascinating person when it came to uh, hadith. Uh, Al-Hafidh, Abu Al-Fatih Al-Ya'muri, is a hafidh in hadith. Okay, you can find this in Kitab Dayl al-Tabaqat al-Hanabila ibn, ibn Rajab al hanbali brings it. Al-Hafidh Abu Al-Fatih Al-Ya'muri, what did he say? He said, Anna ibn Taymiyyah kada yastaw'ibu al-sunana wal-athara hifdhan. That he nearly memorized all of the sunnah hadiths of the Prophet ﷺ and all of the athar from the sahabas and tabi'in. It's like he encompassed it all to the extent that he said about him, He knew the men, the narrators, their criticism, the praise that were put on them, their levels. He knew the funun al hadith, the different fields of hadith, al rijal, jarh al ta'adil, yani, ilal al hadith, yani, he knew it, takhrij al hadith, he knew all of that, mustalah al hadith, he knew that. The hadith which is Ali, the hadith which is Nazil, he knew it. As Sahih was Saqib, he knew the authentic, the weak one. Ma hifdihi li mutunihi ladhi infarada bihi. He also knew that who was alone in that hadith from the tabi'in or from that narrator who singled in this, he knew that. Rahimahullah ta'ala. 
Look what he said after that. He said, وَهُوَ عَدِيمُ فِي اسْتِحْرَارِ وَاسْتِخْرَاجِ الْحُجَّةِ مِنْهُمْ The powerful thing, brothers and sisters, is sometimes we can memorize the entire page of the Qur'an. But if I asked you to get a particular certain ayah for me like that, in this particular issue, it's a different story. This is what Shaykh Rasulullah Taymiyyah had. Yani he, he can quickly go to his brain. He can th- bring out a hadith and the wording for this one, in which he use, wants to use it for a mas'ala. He was something else. Dhabi is speaking, um, this is all from Imam Dhabi. He said, He was so unique, brothers and sisters, in attributing the hadith into where it was taken from. He says, this is the wording of Bukhari and this is the wording of Muslim. Allahu Akbar. He will, that he'll break it down like that. Actually, there was a time when I was reading Majmu' al-Fatawa li Shaykh Lissam Taymiyyah. I was trying to go through it the first time, actually, when I was going through it. I came across Shaykh Lissam Taymiyyah in the ninth volume, where he says, Rahimahullah wa rahmatan wasi'ah, وَأَظُنُّهُ رَوَاهُ يعني He mentioned a scholar of hadith who narrated the hadith. I think this person narrated it. And subhanAllah, I looked down at the muhaqqiq of the kitab. What, did he agree with him? Did he disagree with him? Did he, he put a note at the bottom of the kitab and he said, yes, he's right. He's in there. <laughs> Even when he says, I think hadith is narrated there, it's there. All of these books that you've you seen that Shaykh Al-Sam Taymi wrote, it was in a, he was sitting down and he wrote it from his memory. Go and look at the Kitab al Look at He wrote that from memory, right? <laughs> he wrote that from memory. He wrote it from memory. Look how many ayat he mentions. Look how many hadiths he mentions. The whole book is just pages of ayat and hadiths and ayat of hadith. All meant from memory, brothers and sisters. Allahu Akbar. The third thing I want to speak about his, his knowledge of the science of hadith is tafsir. And I think this was his best. Yani this, people think Ibn Taymiyyah, Aqeed and everything. Allahumma barik. He was a shaykh of Islam, right? Lakin his knowledge of tafsir, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. That's all I can say. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. How he knew the mufassirin who said this, Qawl Mujahid, Qawl Qatada, Qawl this, Qawl this, this is his view, this is his view. He would even do ta'qibat on Ibn Jarir al-Tabari. Yu'aqib alayhi. Ah. And I'll give you one example. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, in one ayah, he would go to different references and sources just for that one ayah. Rahimahullah. Yeah, brothers and sisters. What he used to do in Dimashq, listen to this here, Bazaar mentions this in his tarjama. He said he would sometimes come to the gathering. Brothers and sisters, please listen. He said he would come to the gathering. Someone would narrate, uh, recite an ayah randomly from the Quran. Random ayah from the Quran. They would read on him. He would close his eyes and he would t- do tafsir of this ayah. He would bring every single thing related to that verse. Barzali said, وَكَانَ مَجْلِسُهُ فِي وَقْتٍ مُقَدَّرٍ بِقَدَرِ رُبْعِ النَّهَارِ يَفْعَلُ ذَلِكَ بَدِيهَةً He will do this all from spontaneously. مِنْ غَيْرِ أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُ قَارِئِ There's no one who's reading from somewhere for him to, like you know how people read books on us and we just comment on it. No, nobody's doing that for him. The ayah will be recited, خلاص. And guess what he does? He will read the tafsir. He will say, look what he said. Uh, there wasn't a particular thing he would read on him or was recited on him. So he can prepare the tafsir the night before. No, no, no. That wasn't there. Randomly someone who said read an ayah. He'll just choose random person and say, yeah, you read an ayah. Right? We take the benefit from that. And he would do the tafsir of that ayah. Are we all together? One of the things that he did like that, he did tafsir on, was Qulhu Allahu Ahad. And today it's a volume. It's a volume. All of it from memory. It was dictated from his mouth. The students started writing it. One of the tafsir he gave was Ar Rahmanu Al Arshi Stawa. 35 Karasa. 
it reached. Al-Bazzar said, it reached me that Ibn Taymiyyah sat down. And Rahman al Arstawa would be like 10 volumes right now if we were to publish it. Bazzar, look what he said. He said, it reached me that he wrote a tafsir book. If he completes it, it will be 50 volumes. But we don't have it. We don't have it. 50 volumes in tafsir, Shaykh al Now I'm going to go to this fourth science that he had, which is the last one, well, last one I'm going to mention, which is fiqh. Ibn Taymiyyah in fiqh, of course, he started ala madhhab al-imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. But that doesn't mean he was in line with the madhhab and the fatawa of the... No, he wasn't like that. Ibn Taymiyyah was a mujtahid. He will say, he'll give fatwa based on what he believed was the evidence and the proof. Al Imam al Dhahabi mentioned about him when it came to fiqh. He said, وَفَاقَ النَّاسِ فِي مَعْرِفَةِ الْفِقْهِ وَاخْتِلَافِ الْمَذَاهِبِ وَفَتَاوَ الصَّحَابَةِ وَالتَّابِعِينَ He surpassed the people in the understanding of fiqh. The different madahibs in this issue, the fatawa and the verdicts of the sahabas and tabi'in. He surpassed them. بِحَيْثُ إِذَا أَفْتَى That if he gave a fatwa, لَمْ يَلْتَزِمْ بِمَذْهَبٍ He will never stick to a particular madhab. بَلْ بِمَا يَقُومُ عَلَيْهِ الدَّلِيلِ He would say what he believed the evidence was with. That's the type of person he was. Because he, look what he has in his head. He knows the furu' al masail is, He's pictured it properly, perceived it properly. On top of that, he knows the madahibs in this issue. And then he knows the verdicts of the sahabas and the tabi'in in this issue and the proofs that were used. So he knew which one he wanted to take and which view that he wanted to support and defend. Rahimahullahu, rahmatan wasi'ah. Even his يعني, enemies affirm that. Like Kamaluddin ibn Zamlakani. Zamlakani, look what he said. He said, كان الفقهاء من سائر الطوائف. Ibn Taymiyyah again is believed to be a Hanbali, right? The other madhabs, like the Shafi'iyya and the Malikiyya and the Hanafiyya, they used to what? إِذَا جَالَسُوهُ If they sat with Ibn Taymiyyah, استفادوا في مذاهبه منه شيئا. أما منه أشياء. They will benefit something from him, from their own madhabs. وَلَا يَعْرِفُ أَنَّهُ وَلَا يُعْرَفُ It is not known أنه ناظر أحدا. It is not known that Ibn Taymiyyah ever debated someone. فانقطع معه. Which Ibn Taymiyyah became silent. He didn't know what to say. Never happened. Look what Zamlakani even went on to say. وَلَا تَكَلَّمَ فِي عِلْمِ مِنَ الْعُلُومِ Ibn Taymiyyah never spoke about a science or a knowledge-based issue. سواء كان في علم الشرع Whether it was a religious issue, religious knowledge. Or even outside that. إِلَّا فَاقَ فِيهِ أَهْلُ He was better than the specialist in those fields. وَاجْتَمَعَ Look what he said about Zamlakani saying. This is his staunch enemy. وَاجْتَمَعَ فِيهِ شُرُوطُ الْإِجْتِهَادِ عَلَى وَجْهِهَا يعني Ibn Taymiyyah, the conditions the prerequisite of being a mujtahid, which is a person who can do independent reasoning, were present Ibn Taymiyyah. Are we all together, brothers? That being said, Ibn Taymiyyah gave fatwa on some issues where he went against the four madhabs. He was a mujtahid. He went against the four madhabs. He went against what was commonly known by the people. Ibn Abdul Hadi mentions it in his kitab, Uqud al durri I'm going to mention some of those things that he went against the four madahibs in. Or should, should I not mention it? Yeah, or should I mention it? Yeah, brothers and sisters. One of the things is the famous, I'm going to mention the most famous one, is the issue of talaq al thalath The three divorces with يعني, one time saying, I divorce you three times. Okay, somebody says to his wife, uh, يعني, one, with one word, he says, I divorce you three times. Ibn Taymi opposed the call of the A'immatul Arba'ah. The second thing he opposed them at the four madhabs in, is the issue of uh, traveling. When you're traveling, the distance of the traveling, is there a certain distance or is there not? Rutemi said, La. Shortening the prayer as a, tra as a traveler, 
okay what يعني مسافة is needed he يعني he went against them for malaibs in this issue he went against sujood tilawa when you recite the quran when you recite the quran and you come across a verse in the quran where is a sujood should you have wudu or not the team went against the four madhabs are we all together So there's a lot of things that he, rahimahullah, went against the four madhabs. Rahimahullah, rahmatan wasi'ah. One of the greatest praises I've come across of Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, was that which Al-Hafidh Abu Al-Hajjaj Al-Mizi, the author of the kitab Tahdeeb Al-Kamal wrote, or said about him. Uh, he said, Ma ra'aytu mithlahu. I've never seen anyone like Ibn Taymiyyah. ولا راى هو مثل نفسه and he never saw anyone like himself وما رايت احدا اعلم i have never seen anyone more knowledgeable بكتاب الله the book of allah وسنه رسوله and the sunnah of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم ولا اتبع لهما منه and more following of the kitab and the sunnah than him that really gives you an understanding of who of who he was رحمه الله رحمه واسعه والله brothers and sisters I wish I could have spoken about the book today. I was th- I thought I could have spoken about the book today. We have 10 minutes. Should we go into the book? Speak about the book? I think let's talk about the book inshallah ta'ala. Okay. The kitab is called so now we finished the author and who he was. We're now going to go into the kitab then the book. Okay? The name of this book is what? The name of the book is called At-Tadmuriya. There are two views when it comes to this name. What, where did it come from? Okay. There's one view, which is that the word Tadmuriya, Tadmuriya, uh, it's an attribution to a city in Sham. In today's modern day, modern day Turkey. Okay. What a day? Turkey. A question came from a student of knowledge from this city, this Medina to Medina to Tadmur. And Shaykh Al-Islam Taymiyyah, when a question would come to me from a particular place, it would be attributed to that place. Like Al-Wasitiyya, attributed to a place called Wasit. Al-Hamawiyya, attributed to a place called Hama. Are we all together? So the first view is that it's a Nisba ila Balad. It's a attribution to a particular city. Does that make sense? The first view is ila ila balad asail. The questioner who asked the question, uh, the city he came from when he asked the question. That's that's one view. Does everyone understand that view? Yeah. Does anyone know what the second view is? Who can guess what the second view is? Does anyone have any other view what the second view is? Beautiful. And that is that the name Tadmuriya, it comes from Ya'ani to demir, it destroys the belief of the corrupted people. Tadmir. Which is to destroy. The Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he was destroying the foundation of those people who uh, pushed a ideology that goes against that which the p- pious predecessors were upon. Sah? Are we all together? Which is the second view. 
Now what I want to talk about is why is it important why have I chosen this book and what is the importance of this book? Okay? I want to talk about Ahmiyatul Kitab, the importance of this book. Risalat al Tajmuri, as I mentioned, is min al Kutub al Salafiyya, it's Kutub Ahl Sunnah, which clarifies what? Aqidatu Ahl Sunnah. It explains Aqidatu Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Okay? I'm going to summarize the benefit in, into four things. The first one is the importance of some of the things that he discusses that you rarely find any, everywhere or anywhere else. Ahmiyatul Mawadir. The important topics uh, uh, the important topics in which he researched in this book. Can he really discuss it? We're going to see it inshallah ta'ala. The second thing he, the importance of this book comes is a lot of the people a lot of people believe ideologies that are actually from the innovators that they didn't actually even know. Sah? يعني ما غلب على الناس من انتحال البدع الاعتقادية A lot of the people have incorporated in their lives innovative beliefs and ideologies that they didn't know that was innovation. I didn't know this was innovation. Okay, I actually did not know this was innovation. Ibn Taymiyyah brings it to light for those people. The third importance that this book really has is the evidences he uses. Yani, it teaches you how to use those evidences the way he do, does it. The, the third one is that he teaches you the evidences, how to apply those evidences, how to use it. I have ayah, how does this ayah benefit me in this matter? Oh, Allahumma bari. So it's like you're in a tafsir class. And the evidence is, is actually destroying what? Usul al mutakallimi. When, when we say usul, it means under their furu, many things fall under it. So he's giving you evidences that can destroy them from the base, from the foundation. So once you learn it, you can tackle their issues from a what? From a fundamental. Okay? Last but not least, the, 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 there's really let, little Al Kutub al Salafiyya, Qillat Kutub al Salafiyya, ala hadi tariqa. There's little books of Salafis that have been written in this way Sheikh Hussam Taymi wrote it. Before or after him? I mean, after him, people copied him, used his tariqa like Ibn Uthaymin al Qawaid al Muthla. He benefited from the Tadmuri of Sheikh Hussam Taymi, especially the chapter when he does Munadhar Ahl al Bid'ah and he uses the Qawaid. Yani the six of the seven principles Ibn Taymiyyah used in Tadmuriyah, Ibn Uthaymin took that from him and put it in his Qawaid al Muthla. But before that, no, nobody, nobody, the principles he gives, no one saw it. The evidences and how he applied it, it was rare. Okay? So these three or four points actually show you the benefits of the uh, Imam's book, why it's so important to study this book. Okay? And I told you before, this is book is a summary of his works. And it's the last book 
when it comes to the ta'seel of Shaykh Islam Taymi's works. Yani, Wasati is the first, then the Hamawi is the second, and the last one is the Tadmuriya. After that, Ibn Taymiyyah's works, they're not ta'seel anymore. They're rudud, munadara, yani niqashat. He's, you're, you're not gonna, you're not gonna learn uh, ta'seel uh, purely from it. You're, you're, you're gonna be exposed to uh, ideologies. So the higher you go, the more you get exposed to it. For, for example, Wasati, he doesn't bring any doubts of theirs to the table per se. Okay, Hamawiya, some things are there. Lakin at Tadmuriya, he goes out onto them. So you're, you're, bit by bit, you're getting introduced to other groups out there. And then when you go to the other five books that I mentioned, you're now exposed to oceans of doubts and, and problems that are there. One of the tactics that Ibn Taymiyyah uses, uh, and he taught this to his student, Ibn Qayyim, is that he said, make your heart like a mirror. Make your heart like a what? He said to his student, Ibn Qayyim, make your heart like a mirat, a, a mirror. And don't make it like a sponge. Why? Because the sponge, it swallows things and it keeps it in. Ibn Taymiyyah said, don't swallow these doubts and everything. And he keep it on a mirror, you can wash it off easily. You can wipe it off easily. Okay? That's how it is, he said. You need to be able to get rid of all of these. Okay. It's 12 o'clock now for us here. And... Uh, I don't know, it's it's your choices, brothers and sisters. Should we stop? Is it over? Should we stop? If you think we should stop, just say number one. And if you think we should carry on, we can carry on for maybe another 10 to 15 minutes. So who thinks we should stop? So say number one if you think we should stop. Number one if you think we should stop. I think there's a lot of people who are asking for us to stop it, so I think it's fair to, to really take into consideration what they want as well, because some of them have salah times coming in for them and everything. So I, I will stop there. Um, next lesson, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to discuss Mabahith al Kitab, what this book deals with. So I'm going to give you all, inshallah ta'ala, an overview of the book. Brothers and sisters, pay attention to this. I'm going to give you an overview of the book. So well, inshallah ta'ala, structured that when we go into the book, it will make so much sense for you. And what? It will make so much sense for you. Like, okay, I understand here. Okay. So I'm going to break it down from that perspective. I'm going to try to give you a, yani, an overview of the whole entire kitab. Because uh, I've, before, uh, yani, I started the kitab, this, specifically this week. I did a talkhis of the kitab, I summarized that, I got rid of all the istidradat Ibn Taymiyyah came with and I wrote a mulakhas of the kitab. So the mulakhas is the, the, the gist of what the book is about. So that's basically the overview for you guys. Uh, even the mulakhas is, uh, for me it's like uh, yani 60 pages, okay, 62 pages without the fahras in there. So I'll just make it into three, four pages for you. Summarize even that one for you to give you the overview of what the book is, inshallah ta'ala. Okay? Um, uh, yes, I've taught the Kitab al aqidat al-Wasatiyya And I have taught the Haqidat al hamawiyah before previously uh, Some of you might ask, okay, this Kitab Should I study if I haven't done al-Wasatiyya al hamawi Ideally, it would be nice uh, to have studied al wasatiyah At least al wasatiyah of course uh, And if you did al hamawiyah even better But if you didn't, it happened that you didn't No problem The way I'm going to explain it, inshallah ta'ala Is going to be so, yani we might spend on one line the whole entire lesson, the two hours. We might spend on just on one line. Okay? And explain that and explain that and break that down and break it down, break it down, break it down so you can all, inshallah ta'ala, benefit from it. Okay? Anyone have any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Who do you think is most likely the Ibn Taymiyyah of our modern times? 
I don't know. I don't think. I don't think any woman can give birth to the likes of Ibn Taymiyyah after him. I think it's it's hard to say. It's it's, re, it's very close. Very hard. Very hard to have another him again. I mean, we you know we don't give up on Allah's mercy, Subhanahu wa Taala. I don't think anyone's like this, like that man. Rahimahullah. I don't think we will see someone like that. Yeah. Um, is this book suitable for one who studied most of Aqid Wasli? Yes, 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 inshallah. The way I'm going to be teaching is like, I'm going to bring Aqid Wasli in there. I'm going to bring yani, the previous books that you sh if you've not taken, I'll mention them here, inshallah. Uh, so I'll break down the whole entire book. Even if we spend so much time on just a few words to explain what it really means and what is entailed by it and everything, Yani, by studying al wasati al hamawiyah would just make it easier for me when I explain things. But it doesn't mean you won't understand. It will just make it, yani, I'd have to explain it more and more the tatmuriyah. Does that make sense? It, I would just have to explain it more and more until the student, the student understands it. But if you've done wasati al hamawiyah, when I mention a few points, you'll be like, oh, it makes sense. I've taken that in wasati. That's, that's, that's the only, that's the benefit you get from studying previous books before this. But does it mean that if you don't have, if you've never studied the Wasati or Hamawiya, uh, that you won't understand Tadmuri at all? No, you will understand it. Inshallah ta'ala. Uh, especially, I'm going to be speaking in English language and I'm going to be writing everything on the board like this. I'm, I'm going to write a lot of things down. Inshallah, and I'm going to try to engage you all to ask questions. And if you understood it, why have you, like, what, what is it that you didn't understand? And we will discuss it there, inshallah ta'ala. So, a good, good question was asked. Is, I had a question. Someone said the terms that Ibn Taymiyyah brings in Wasatiyah, like a Ta'wil and Tamthil and etc., were these terms prominently used by the innovators at his time? They, yes, they, they used it a lot. By the way, that's also another point that we're going to be talking about in this book. There's a section where he talks about the Shaykh Rahimahullah Ta'ala. He talks about Al Fad, which are Mujmala, ambiguous terms that are used. So, inshallah ta'ala, as we talk about Ta'wil and Ta'til and the difference between the two, we'll discuss that, inshallah ta'ala. Um, are the teachers of the two sheikhs Ibn Taymiyyah and Abdul Wahab similar? No, 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 no. Ibn Taymiyyah and Abdul Wahab, Wahab there's a diff there's a big yani, time between the two of them, right? They were not in the same era. They were not in the same time. You know. Um, someone asked a good question. They said, how long would this book take to finish Ustad? I would say to all of you guys, don't worry about when it finishes and how long it takes. Be more concerned about understanding inshallah. I'll try my best to finish it uh, the quickest and the, the most يعني, suitable time. But our concern is the understanding more than the, the, the how long is it going to take. Definitely we're going to finish it, inshallah ta'ala. Definitely we will. Uh, we will, inshallah ta'ala. Bidni al kirim from alive. But I'm not I'm not too restricted with the, with the time. I, I, I want to explain it in details. I want to go into يعني, uh, in great details for you to all understand the kitab. Just like today, I went into details. That today, what I did is exactly what I'm going to be doing through the whole entire explanation. Can one name uh, one's daughter Taymiyyah? Yes, of course you can. Of course you can. You can call your daughter Taymiyyah. In early generation, Ta'wil and Tafsir were synonymous. Yes, they were. Why did the scholars of later generations separate the meaning of those words? Again, this is something we're going to come to inshallah ta'ala when we talk about terms and words and how that affected the aqeedah of many people. Because you're right, Ibn, Ibn Jarir Tabari, for example, he, and he says in many places in his tafsir, actually nearly everywhere, he'll say to you, وَتَأْوِيلُ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى In the word ta'wil here, he means, uh, to tafsir, he means. And... The usage of the word ta'wil, how many usages does it have in the Quran and in the Sunnah and the Arabs and what they use it as? And even Ibn Taymiyyah, he, he avoided using the word at uh, ta'wil in Aqid al when he is the munadhara that he had. And he said, I avoided using the word ta'wil. Instead, I used the word tahrif. Uh, and why he did that, we're going to talk all about all of that, inshallah. What is the definition of mujtahid mutlaq? 
In simple terms, a mujtahid mutlaq is a person who can do independent reasoning. He can look at the evidence and extract rulings from it. Whether there's someone who agrees with him or not, it doesn't matter. He looks at the Quran and the Sunnah and the principles that the scholars have put down. And from there, he stipulates rulings on contemporary issues without looking at who preceded him or not. Yeah. No. Uh, and who reached, how many uh, scholars reached this status? It's... So, you see this concept of who reached and who hasn't reached it. It's 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 it's, it's not in it's not my place or anyone else to really say this person reached it and this person didn't. I and mean, sometimes a person can be a mujtahid mutlaq in a certain field, and not necessarily in another field. Or someone might be a mujtahid mutlaq in the entire religion. Waha kada, that makes sense. So, but one of the last people that was was mentioned to be a mujtahid mutlaq, one of the last people. Was uh, Imam Jalaluddin Jalal al-Suyuti Okay Someone asked a question and said Was Ibn Taymi a Sufi? I will say to that person Inshallah ta'ala Try to finish with us this kitab Tadmuriya And you're going to see if he was a Sufi If he was a Sufi But in a short term In a short answer No he wasn't a Sufi uh, the question really is, what do you mean by Sufi? Do you mean Sufi as in after Abu Hamid al-Ghazali onwards? Uh, who, yani, where Ash'ariya and Tasawwuf took another turn where they became mystic and yani, Wuhdat al-Wujud and Hakkad and many things corrupted in them? Or are you talking about Zuhd like Suleiman al-Darani and al-Junaid and the Sufi of Ibrahim ibn Adham and these guys. That tasawwuf of Ibrahim ibn Adham and al Junaid and Sulaiman al Darani was good. Okay? Where they came back to the Quran and the Sunnah and the uh, the views of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een. So, it, all this we're going to discuss it, inshallah ta'ala, uh, about this whole topic, inshallah ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, this book is going to teach us all of that and more. Uh, I think inshallah ta'ala I'm going to go myself It's quite late now It's 12.11 uh, I really appreciated Teaching you all I really did And I hope you all benefited I really do hope you benefited Brothers and sisters There's one thing I'm going to ask you for I am I'm, I am And that is Please remember me In your dua Please make dua for me And my family And my progeny Please make dua for them That Allah protects them From evil And that Allah makes them يعني ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذريتنا قرة عين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما and that Allah removes from each and every one of us that make dua for, for, for that that Allah removes all distress and hardship and suffering and pain that every Muslim is going around in the world everyone's going uh, going through in this world that Allah removes it from us سبحانه وتعالى please brothers and sisters remember me uh, in your dua and I truly, sincerely mean this. Allahi, sitting here and teaching you guys makes me happy so much. Honestly, it does. I'm so happy when I teach you all. Yani, as they say, I didn't break a sweat. I really enjoyed it. It made me enthusiastic and uh, energy was, was there. Allah mubarak. So, Jazakumullah khairan for listening to me. And you all promise me you're going to make dua for me? Is that a promise? Is that a promise? Because if you don't, we might not let you come into the next class. <laughs> uh, but please make you remember me in your dua. Barakallahu feekum, brothers and sisters alike. And Jazakumullah uh, khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Someone asked a good question and uh, Sister, what was the question you asked? You said, please answer my question What was the question you asked, so I, uh, asked so, that I can, so that I can answer it? Can we fast on Mondays and Thursdays With the intention of losing weight alongside Sunnah? Yeah, if you're fasting because of yeah, and you can combine between few intentions in one action. Um, you can. And, um, you can. But you have to remember that it's an act of obedience and it's a ibadah and not a. Uh, it's not a uh, losing weight program. That it's a, it's a ibadah. 
is getting closer to Allah with it, inshallah ta'ala. And as a byproduct, by, by it, it, this comes with it, that this happens, then alhamdulillah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters.